So, Donald, you've been reading and studying a lot about the Toyota production system. Why are we interested in that with respect to the book? What has it got to tell us about socialism? Yeah, I recently have been writing about this and, and reading a lot about it. And basically, by way of introduction to the Toyota production system, I would say it's one of the two major paradigms that came from industrial production in the 20th century. And the reason that it's interesting, I suppose the reason that the whole topic is interesting is because they, both of them, uh, and we can discuss the two of them in a moment, the Toyota production system is one and sort of another one is characterized as Fordism and Taylorism. They're kind of distinct concepts, but linked together. Well, both of these paradigms come with a lot of baggage in terms of the social relations that they help to create. They're kind of like their production systems, but they come with a sort of set of implied rules and criterions that make it so that the system reproduces itself and people's relationships with each other, people's, how people interact economically, kind of socially within the organization, within the industry, how it works. So it's pretty interesting. And I think from a socialist point of view, there's a really a clear clear path forward that comes from this stuff once you start to once you start to get an understanding of it. okay so i suppose we should probably start at the scratch and talk about what was the state of the art before the toyota production system came about well before the toyota production system came about the state of the art was basically to sum it up kind of crudely a sort of expert system an expert system in, in engineering is a system where you have a set of rules that have been drawn up in advance, basically, which dictate how the system works. So you kind of have for each part of the system, it's kind of work instructions, and those work instructions are expected to be carried out. You have some kind of criteria that they're based on. So basically, in, a, in an industrial organization, it would be like the management of the organization uh, have the responsibility for drawing up these work instructions for everyone for all the different departments and so on, what they should be doing. For the workers, of course, on the factory floor, they have their work instructions. It's very specific. They're working basically according to a very specific predefined set of instructions. That's the idea of an expert system. So in technical terms, that was seen at the time as the scientific, the sort of application of the scientific method to production. It was to get rid of all ad hoc processes. And it was to say, we will have a, an official way of doing everything. So these instructions, this was kind of this whole idea of time and motion studies that came in, like that Taylor is famous for, for analyzing the exact movements of person on an assembly line and, and minimizing the actual amount of motion they do. Right. So first of all, we can, we can break things up, this kind of previous paradigm that was there, into, on the one hand, Taylorism, which you've described very well as being basically a system for the elimination of waste. That's how it was presented. Like he... His view was that workers who were being hired to do work were inherently lazy. That's how he put it. And that this laziness was really the, the major problem that industry had, that everyone was slacking, nobody wanted to work. And the way that you got around this was with this kind of expert system where you would predefine exactly the work that the workers all had to do. So the workers who would turn up to work, for example, in a production site would follow through on these instructions to the letter, literally with a foreman holding a stopwatch watching them. And that was the the optimal way. That was the scientific way of approaching things. So there's no more wasted movement. There's no more turning around when you really should be, you know, you should have the tool directly in front of you. Everything was laid out. Everything was prearranged. And your job was to sort of be the ideal worker. Your job as a worker in that situation was to fulfill the expectations that had been laid out for you. So this is a kind of a very fundamentally kind of instrumentalist view of the worker. You know, when it gets to the kind of extreme implementation on a, say, a, an assembly line that the worker should, their arms should move in a certain way in a certain number of times per minute, that the, the worker is viewed as a machine. It's not so much like Marx, they were an appendage of a machine, but the worker themselves was actually now kind of viewed as a machine, just a machine to be programmed by the industrial engineer who could tell them exactly what their motion and their what their expected behavior should be. Yeah, that's a pretty good way to think about it. That fits very well with the dominant social relations 
in a capitalist economy because the whole point is that is that workers are there to perform a service for the person who has bought their ability to do work. So it sort of gels very well with that. So if you think about just in terms of like a simple thing, the material result of this is compensation. You know, So the, the worker who works very hard on the production line might be paid a performance bonus for producing more than what the idealized situation would even anticipate, right? So you're very strong, you're very fast, you're going to produce a lot more than the weaker, slower coworker next to you. You're going to get rewarded and he or she is going to either, you know, have a pay cut or terminate their employment, right, for example. And this was really uh, expressed through the ideas like the piece rate system, where people would literally be paid by the amount of parts that they made in the work site. So it was very, very explicitly locked in to the system that people were being evaluated as individuals relative to an ideal. And that's relative to an ideal that was summed up in this kind of expert system. And that also extended to not just to workers on a production line, for example, where you think it's just manual labor, but also to mental labor. So all of these kind of companies would have a sales department and industrial engineering departments. They'd have procurement and supply chain departments and so on. And they're doing mental labor of different kinds. And they are also being held to performance targets. They have their own expert system. And it's kind of a reflection of the the, the exact same idea. So tell us then about Toyota and why they went a different route to this kind of standardized tailorist approach. Okay, so yeah, if the tailorist approach is kind of like an expert system, then the Toyota approach is like a cybernetic system. They didn't really set out to create a cybernetic system. It just kind of unfolded. It's very clear when you read the, the work on this, both the people who were involved in it themselves from Toyota and also people who've written about this and studied it extensively, that the cybernetic stuff came from a realization of what was required for the system to work. So just before I carry on, I think there's like an important conceptual thing to understand that the Taylor stuff works as a package. You know, it kind of works as a, all of the social relations that come from that, how people expect to be treated in the job, how the job treats people, how the system works technically, it all kind of works together in a way that's not internally contradictory. You know? Right, it's a kind of a holistic thing. You know, it's, it's, it's basically, it is the kind of, you know, the class system itself of people giving and taking orders, you know, people in charge, people fulfilling it, being rewarded for their kind of innate abilities and being punished if they don't have them. It's just the class system up and down. Right, very much so. And when we talk about a cybernetic system, it wasn't that Toyota went out went with some kind of intention to like change the world or something and then had insights resulting from that. It was the fact that they when they went to try to improve the production process, this was where that journey took them. It took them towards a different kind of system. Okay, so do you want to tell us then like the history of why it was that they were forced in a different direction than the standard, you know, industrial methods of the time? All right, so Toyota's starting point was basically the state of the art at the time after the Second World War. So you can imagine Toyota was there in Japan. Japan was in ruins after the Second World War. All the cities had been firebombed and atomic bombs and everything else. So Japan was in that kind of state. They had a lot of problems. So one of the problems they had was they couldn't build big factories. They didn't have the kind of investment capital that Ford and General Motors and all the big American companies had. And they also didn't have a sort of consumer market that could support a mass consumer base. So you had both of those things in the United States. And that's why you had these huge companies making like millions of cars. They could, they were operating these kind of Fordist uh, and Taylor systems. And so Toyota's starting point was they said, okay, we need to, we need to make a, a system that will work for our conditions. When you say these Ford or Taylor systems, these were in essence mass production systems. These were these giant assembly lines that were like churning out large numbers of cars and through scale, they were able to minimize costs. Right. So just before going on to onto Toyota, I think it's good to actually distinguish between between Fordism and Taylorism as such, why, why we're speaking about the two things separately. So the Fordist idea was based on the pretty specific idea of the factory assembly line. The, the basic idea of the factory assembly line is to establish a flow of products through a factory from the beginning to the end, where component parts are added to the product as it is assembled 
in a row, essentially. And this was a kind of new conception of how you could do this because what you would do is have at every stage in production, you would have components essentially piled up beside the workstation where that stage of production would be done and then it would be passed on to the next. So this meant you could have very, very fast production of very, very complicated products. So it's not a coincidence that the assembly line emerged in the manufacture of automobiles, which was the the kind of most complicated kind of production out there. And you needed to produce it at big scale in order for it to be commercial. So all these factors brought together the mass production system. And that was the Fordism. That was the basis of Fordism. That was subsequently represented in all kinds of manufacturing industries after that. That was the system that Toyota found when they started to tour these factories in the early 1950s. To, to get back to your question, Toyota's starting point from that basis of what they could see was that this system produced basically what they called internal overproduction. So Toyota started out with the idea of fixing Taylorism. They viewed themselves as basically Taylorist, as trying to apply an empirical lens to production as it existed, as Taylor had, and designing a new system that would eliminate, just like him, eliminate wasted labor time from the value-adding labor process. But they thought that the, that Taylor's way of doing this, ironically, created lots of wasted labor time, in addition to wasted product and so on. That was where they started out. This, they, they wanted a waste-free production process, and they thought that the basic requirement of the Fordus production line as it was being used by this system, again, this kind of the Taylor study on the production line on the shop floor was that workers should as individuals, be judged in terms of carrying out their production tasks that were pre-specified to them as efficiently as possible. So they were all doing this all the time, working in shifts. And what that meant was that you had significant waste within the system through internal overproduction because each step in the production process of component parts that would, for example, be go into the production of a car that would later be assembled into the body of a car all of these component parts, as they were built up through the production process, were absorbed by each step in production at a different rate. So you would have some very fast steps, other quite slow. And what that would mean is that the very fast steps would generate surpluses of products and the very slow steps wouldn't be able to clear those surpluses. So you can see how you would have internal overproduction as an emerging yeah. property. So they started out with this idea of kind of fixing Taylorism. They wanted to apply an empirical lens, just like Taylor had done, to the production process and design a system that would really eliminate wasted labor time from the labor process. So there's two, two basic problems that they found with, as it was called, push production. And I'll explain why it was called push production that needed to be overcome. The first was that there is basically a loss of information in what efficiency means in a production process in which everyone is being rewarded as an individual, as we spoke about. So imagine that you're a manager in a section of a manufacturing plant and you are being evaluated, just like the workers under you, according to performance metrics as an individual. Well, those performance metrics are going to be about the level of productivity that, you're, that you are managing to achieve as a manager in that section. Now, the problem is that because everyone is doing this, what happens is that production outputs from each section are being manufactured at rates which don't suit the production process as a totality. So I'm, I'm working in, in a production step that takes longer than your one. And what that means if you're supplying product to me is that you're supplying it too fast for me. So I can't clear that, that those inputs that you're giving me. If I'm producing too slowly for someone else, then they'll be waiting around. And they won't be able to beat their targets and meet their production targets. So the problem is that you have a, a system which is full of time wasting, basically. And the reason it's full of time wasting is because what is, in fact, a single flow of human labor that produces some kind of finished product is artificially divided up into these uh, administrative steps where everyone is being evaluated independently. And that's basically the first thing that they found is that you cannot tell in that circumstance what an efficient production process looks like because everyone appears to be very busy, but actually the process isn't very efficient at all. 
Right, and it's in it's inefficient because I might have faster machines than you, and I just start pumping out stuff regardless of the actual ability or desire of the system as to consume my output. So I I, I am incentivized to maximize my output, even if it's not in the overall holistic interests of the business. Right, exactly. And even if you were told beforehand the correct amount of parts that are needed for the day, for example, that your machine is going to produce, what actually happens is your machine is producing them too quickly for, for subsequent stages. So it's this internal, this idea of internal overproduction. You're producing too much for what, or too little for what the supply chain that you're a part of needs at this moment. That means you don't have what is called in, this, in industry flow. You don't have a flow of products. You have the sort of production that's jerking along that's it's really the same thing as overproduction as people usually think about it overproduction from the factory in general if there's not consumer demand for the products that you're making at the time that you make it then it's overproduction you have to pay to store the stuff right yeah it's waste it, the yeah. stuff is going to be obsolete and so on and so on there's a cost yeah. of storage and all this kind of stuff um, can right. you talk also about the, the other dangers of like overproduction and inventory and, and the implications of that for quality yeah. So again, there's more levels to this within the production process that you don't see outside of it. And it's kind of hidden. So one of those that they identified is that it, it incentivizes very poor behavior from the point of view of the process as such, that if you are working and you're trying to, again, beat these uh, productivity targets in order to get your big bonus and so on, the problem is that you don't really care about anything other than that. So exactly the same way in the Soviet Union, where People were getting these kind of bonuses and that you're obliged in that case to try and hoard inventories so that you can always produce at the most productivity possible. That's the kind of dynamic, you know, well, that was what was going on as well in these factories. So the problem that that causes from a point of view of behavior of people is that assume you get like a batch of faulty products. Well, the correct action from your perspective is to throw those products away because and not to try to resolve any kind of problems that are happening somewhere else in the factory or anything like that that's not your problem you're being evaluated for the work that you're doing so throw those products away and you've got a big inventory so you can continue to produce without worrying about those defective inputs similarly if you do, if you have this big inventory you don't care if internal or external suppliers are delivering components to you at the right time as it were at the time that you actually need to process those components all you care about is the fact that you have this big pile of inventory. So you don't need anything to be precise. You don't need anything to, to work in an efficient way. And again, for this reason, you lose the understanding of what efficiency is. But maybe even more importantly, there's no reason for you to improve the production process. The production process becomes stagnant in this case. It doesn't, it doesn't self-improve. It would only improve by way of the top manager's handing down new work instructions bringing in new machinery and so on and that's the only source of improvement now from a cybernetic point of view if you know anything about cybernetics that's really can that's pretty disastrous from a cybernetic point of view the system doesn't respond to its environment you know it's interesting that you have this kind of analog between say the the soviet planning system and these kind of expert systems and mass production systems that they both lead to similar outcomes in regards to kind of inventory hoarding uh, it says something about the nature of like top-down kind of push production well it's no coincidence that that's the case because of course the soviets were keen students of the state of the art of production in the early days of the soviet union and that was the system that they adopted as well so the reason that the production in both cases looks very similar is that is that the soviets were working from the same kind of uh, model now, the difference with the Soviets was they were trying to apply this kind of expert system theory to the whole economy rather than just internal to individual companies. And so you had in certain parts of the economy at certain times, you had much more dramatic dysfunction and it was much more visible. Right, that the, the, the Ford and these places where they were, the, 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 these problems were masked by the fact that they were these kind of large quasi-monopolies that because the scale of production needed to be so big to produce cars efficiently, that the inefficiencies of it was just kind of localized to the car production, that it wasn't something that became generalized to all branches of production. 
Yeah. And also the reason that I said it's kind of, you know, a whole other discussion is because there are certain things with capitalism itself that allow a certain amount of rationalization to happen. Like you have, um, you know, profit and loss and stuff like that, that makes it quite, that exerts a certain amount of pressure on companies to not allow situations to become too bad over time. And those kind of things were, may have existed in the Soviet Union, but they were obviously, you know, the state could, uh, could ignore them basically. And that's what happened in many cases. So yeah, there's, there's a, there's a lot more to say about how the Soviets dealt with industrial production. But the basic idea, the point is the basic push production concept uh, had a common origin in both cases for the big American industry and for the Soviet bloc as well. So how did Toyota go about fixing these kind of core problems associated with, you know, the Fordist, Taylorist mass production? Well, they set out with just the idea of trying to eliminate waste. So Teichi Ono, one of the main kind of guys behind the Toyota production system, he drew a distinction to start out between the difference between kind of movement in general. And this was, he's talking about on the factory floor, like production work and work in particular. So work, he means a sort of value added processing of products, something that actually physically changes a product or assembly. His argument was that in order for a production process to become more efficient, you want to eliminate movements that don't constitute what he regarded as work. And so they found a way to make the production process do that. And that brings us to the kind of origins of the Toyota production system. But it is interesting because obviously anyone from a kind of uh, background of thinking about Marxist economics and stuff like that, they would recognize that there's there's a kind of very interesting idea that Toyota had, which was, first of all, they looked at the production process as a totality, as in the entire supply chain, not just their car factories, but everything leading up to that. And they said, okay, how can we reduce the amount of work, concrete labor that we're doing basically, so that it's less than the socially necessary labor time, sort of less than the average social amount that would be required to make that product. And that's how they thought about profitability. That's how they they said, if we can make our processes more efficient, then we can make our cost of production of the product lower and we can be profitable. That's how they thought about it. Right. And explicitly in terms of labor, <laughs> as in labor was the thing that added the value. Yeah, yeah. They had no no confusion about that. For them, labor was the source of value in production. Labor was the sort of key behind everything. Labor was the way in which you could, or understanding the amount of labor that was required in the production process was the way that you were going to be able to outcompete all of the huge American companies that were their competitors when they were starting out. Right. You know, it's interesting. Like I read one of the books, I bought one of Taichi Ono's books there and I read it. It was actually the wrong one. You told me to buy a certain book and I, re- I bought another one by accident. And But in it, like there was parts where he would like riff on, you know, the Japanese Communist Party and any disagreements they might have over value, what determines value. So I think they were explicitly aware of some of this stuff. But so where did this drive to eliminate waste lead them to? They came to a sort of realization that the best way to eliminate waste was to have the production process do it automatically. And this is something in cybernetics we call an algodonic loop. The idea is the process self-improves through its interaction with the environment and it over time becomes better and better at doing a certain thing. So what they did was they took inspiration from the supermarket replenishment system that was there, whereby there's a small amount of products on the shelf of a supermarket. It starts to run low and it gets replenished, but only in the quantities that are required by the customers, only a small quantity, there's never too many. And they looked at that and they thought, okay, let's apply that to industry. By setting up each step in the production process with these sort of little buffers, like you can imagine the products in the supermarket shelf is like a little buffer of, of products that gets continually added to whenever it whenever it starts to be reduced. They said, we'll apply that to industry. We'll have between each step in the production process, these kind of buffers, and they'll get reproduced. They'll get uh, refilled at the same rate that they're being depleted at. That's the basic idea. Because you're able to do that, you're able to actually see the flow of production in the factory. So you no longer have the situation of having overproduction between production steps. The system is only able to work on the basis of people receiving 
what they need when they need it for the production, for all of the steps in the production process. And furthermore, they said, okay, the smaller the buffer size is, the more precise that the production process has to be. So it's not about speeding up work, as was the case with Taylor's kind of idea. You don't want people to maximize their labor productivity, not necessarily at least. You want efficiency to be maximized in the sense of, as Ono put it, less movement and, and more work. You want the work that is being carried out to produce just what is needed by the production process at the level of labor productivity that is actually required. So that was the that was kind of the fundamental basis. That's how they said, okay, we're going to reduce waste in this way. That exact specific kind of waste that Taylorism produces. That's what they were interested in doing at the beginning. So instead of the idea of pushing production, like just throwing out masses of Model T1, Model T Ford or whatever, the idea is more that you are responding essentially to consumption demand and it essentially pulls production out at the pace out of out of Toyota factories, you know, as if like by pulling a rope, it's pulling the car into existence at the rate at which is needed. So the, these individual, the way you describe these individual units, so all the different various production units producing purely at the rate, the consumption rate, each individual uh, kind of isolated part of production essentially forms its own algodonic loop. Do you want to just describe that a little bit as well? Yeah. So again, this is the kind of the real prize they they figured out of this system was not even that it was very efficient, although it was efficient in the sense that it didn't cause all this time wasting through having different rates of production at every step in the production process. So it brought it brought together production as a single totality because if you were producing too quickly or too slowly for the steps on front of you and behind you, what would happen is your buffer or their buffer of products would be full or empty and production would have to stop. So you can conceptualize it as people are passing, you know, the way you could have like people passing a big bag of rice to each other in a line and they're, they're, they're offloading a truck or something like that of rice and they're passing it one person to the next. Well, if everyone isn't doing it at the same rate, there's going to be a problem, right? So this is the kind of idea. So it has to all be at the same rate. And that's what the system creates. So the real prize of this kind of system is it creates these information signals. It actually allows the process, the supply chain to tell itself, because as you say, the final step in this production process is the rate of consumption of the final product is the car. Or in Ono's example, it was the supermarket shelf. It's the rate of consumption that actually det- of the final product that actually is the only thing that's, that determines everything else. So the rate of, of production and consumption of all prior steps in the production process becomes part of that totality. It's no longer a separate individual thing like it was under Taylorism. These information signals tell every step how much to produce and how quickly the supply chain needs the things to be produced. Right. So you have this idea of the consumer coming in and the rate of consumption is like a big metronome for the whole firm and it's conditioning all the production all these individual steps and it feeds one step back to the other all the way through and then all the way to its external suppliers all the way down to the to the very iron mine and rubber plantation and all of this is conditioned and each of these individual steps both assembly the creation of each individual part is all being conditioned at by this rate and they want everything to be produced at that rate no faster or no slower there is also the this, this idea that when you reduce the buffer size to the minimum, it, it it's kind of like it reminds you of the two thousand and eight financial crisis. There was this like guy who predicted it, this kind of famous hedge fundy guy called uh, Nouriel Roubini, and he, his famous phrase was that like you know when the tie goes out, you'll see who's wearing the swimming shorts or not, right? And it, it, this is the same idea for the TPS that. Uh, as the buffers, the amount of inventory each step is allowed to maintain is reduced and reduced. You start to see, oh, the in- inaccuracies in the production and that it, the, the small buffer size actually forces the production system to get more honed. Yeah, exactly. And this is what, what, this is what they meant really by work versus movement and efficiency and so on. This is, this is the sense they understood it, where, as you said about the, the, the tide going out, they they discussed it in terms of a stream and the level of the stream would be reduced, which is to say the inventory levels would be reduced. You see 
what's there at the at the bottom. You can't hide things in the stream anymore. You can't hide problems. And that's very much how it works. So again, we were talking about how these things were hidden in the, the Fordist or Taylor's kind of factories. Well, in the Toyota factory or in the Toyota production system, quality control becomes something that, for example, is sort of unavoidable in the production system itself. Because if you're handed a batch of faulty products and those faulty products are your inventory, well, you can't process those faulty products, right? It's not going to work. It's not going to be accepted from the point of view of the production process out of totality. Either you reject the parts that you are making because you know the inputs are faulty or subsequent steps will will reject them for that reason. And so in any event, the production process stops because the inventory, which is very small, that would keep it going is no longer there. And so that's just one example. All kinds of things, all kinds of inaccuracies and things being delivered at the wrong rates and so on, they all become intolerable now for the production process. So it has to it has to refine itself. And that's what an algodonic loop is. It's continually refining itself in order to actually be able to um, fulfill its goal, its orientation, according to higher and higher standards. So as you make the buffer smaller, basically what you're doing is saying the work has to be synchronized to a higher standard. You know, compare this to what would happen in, in Ford. Like the, in Ford, the, the holy grail was always to keep the, the line moving, the, the assembly line moving and to maximize output. And like to the extent that if the line was halted, like people could lose their jobs. Foremen would literally could lose their jobs if it halted a few times a month or something. Where in Toyota, they had the absolute opposite approach, whereby they actually like to stop the line <laughs> in the sense that that is what allows the inventories to be reduced and the process itself to be honed. It, to the extent that all, all everywhere along the line, like there are places on the assembly lines for people to actually halt the whole production. And at that point, it becomes absolutely necessary for both those people in that narrow area and maybe also those in related areas to come in and to absolutely brainstorm and solve to make sure this thing never happens again. So it's like, you know, very counterintuitive thing of like reducing your inventories is good because it causes the line to stop, which causes you to fix it, but which in the end allows you to get much higher rates of quality control and much lower rates of unnecessary stock. So it's a, it's a very counterintuitive and very, very interesting cybernetic kind of approach. Can we talk about self-organization within this as well, perhaps, as opposed to the expert system? Yeah, so this has some pretty interesting implications from the point of view of self-organization, because we've already mentioned how, yes, production workers are able to actually stop the line. It's actually called an and-on signal. And this gives rise to self-organized process improvement because then there has to be a discussion as to how to improve the production process so that whatever problem has caused the line to stop won't be a problem again. So again, you see how the production process is like a totality here. The problem may not have been even with the step where the line was stopped. It may have, the problem may have arisen elsewhere. It was only noticed at that point. But regardless, the production process as a whole is now able to take stock of that and make improvements based on it. So one of the things that comes out of that is the whole area of line scheduling, where obviously under the kind of expert system, the idea is that the foreman tells you where you're going to work, or if you're in a department, your manager tells you exactly what you're going to be working on, what you're going to be doing, and so on. And you have to just complete the tasks. Well, if you have a situation where people are self-organizing process improvements all the time to production processes, and other kinds of processes within the factory, which management did not pre-plan. So these these innovations are coming from the bottom up. And we can talk about how that works in a minute, because that's very interesting and, and important for us. But for now, it's just important to say they're, pre, they're, they're not pre-planned from the top down. They're coming from the bottom up. And that means that you can't really schedule where different amounts of people should be working in the factory because the labor productivity of different places in the factory is always changing. And of course, it's changing as a result of demand changes as well. But basically, Toyota production system has a way of managing that. So with the line scheduling, what I mean by that is people registering themselves on different production lines will basically register themselves on the production line where 
the work is currently required in terms of demand is being pulled from different production lines along the chain from the final product backwards through the factory and also the current state of process improvement to the different places. So you might have a line that used to require six workers, now it only requires four workers to meet the daily average, let's say, production requirements of that line. So a reorganization starts to happen in the factory where people who used to be doing just strictly production tasks are now doing production and process improvement tasks. And what that means is that the kind of industrial engineers who used to do the process improvement tasks, and they used to focus really on that, they can step back and they do things like organizing education and training for workers so that the workers who self-organize where they're going to be working from day to day are able to avail of training so that they're able to work on more and more production areas. And that frees them to be able to say, okay, I was working doing this, but I know that even if we improve that production process, so I'm not needed there anymore, I know I've got training to work on different lines. So there's a reorganization of responsibilities within the factory under the TPS. This is what I mean about social relations, the kind of who is doing what and who is relating to who in different ways that changes compared to the old expert system. Right. And so instead of this, the production system being the expert system where we have like a cohort of process engineers or industrial engineers defining, you know, standards and how work should be, instead of having like those those two to three percent of the firm or whatever would be trying to organize production. Because we have these like very low inventories, it becomes absolutely imperative that the process is actually being optimized and standardized by the workers at that point so instead of having like you know three percent industrial engineers you now have like you know maybe 70 80 90 percent of people involved in the improvement of these production processes and that's perhaps the true essence of the toyota production system is benefit is that it's able to it it, it kind of engenders this self-organization of process at a fundamental level throughout the firm, you know, which is something that this top-down kind of a command or expert approach literally cannot, like by, it can't by definition be as good. You can't be everywhere. You can't know everything. You, you know, you don't have all the ideas that everybody, that a greater set of people would have. Right, exactly. And this starts to lend itself to the idea of sort of cooperative social relations within the factory. And this is, again, not stuff that Toyota set out to achieve at all. They were just saying, well, how can we get rid of this waste? And then they said, okay, well, what if we made the production lines self-organized in terms of the amount of products that should be produced and how quickly they should be produced using this pull, as they call it, pull manufacturing system. And that led to all these other things, because if you want to have that, then you kind of need to allow automatic, like self-organized line scheduling, self-organized quality control, and all the other things, 